but I'm um, thrilled to welcome everybody to Grand Rounds for the Department of Medicine on this January 23rd. Um, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Paul Early to talk to us today, and um, and in fact, you know, on a, a, a topic that is relevant for every single one of us sitting here. Um, it is, as we were talking about earlier, I think a talk that is overdue for, for our department. Dr. Paul Early has been an addiction medicine physician for 37 years. He treats all types of addiction disorders, specializing in the assessment and treatment of healthcare professionals. As a therapist, he works with patients in recovery, providing long-term therapy for those who suffer from this disease, and his professional expertise extends to advocacy for professionals before agencies and licensing boards. He is a distinguished fellow of the American Society of Addiction Medicine and has been on that board for over 20 years in several capacities and is the immediate past president of the society. He's been the medical director of two nationally acclaimed addiction programs specializing in the care of healthcare professionals who suffer from addiction illness. And he's currently the medical director of the Georgia Professionals Health Program, the mm -hmm. Physician's Health Program for the state of Georgia in the US and a past pet president of the Federation of State Physician Health Programs. Dr. Early is also the author of three books and many articles on addiction and treatment, um, including the books Recovery Mind Training and Recovery Skills Manual for Recovery Mind Training. He's a contributing author to the textbook on principles of addiction medicine. Um, he is the recipient of the ASAM Annual Award in 2015 for outstanding contributions to the growth and vitality of the American Society of Addiction Medicine for thoughtful leadership in the field and for deep understanding of the art and science of addiction medicine. And he's also the recipient of the 2022 ASAM Leadership Award for his service to the society. Um, and so we are really very privileged um, to welcome you here to talk to us um, about um, uh, mental health and addiction problems among physicians and then physician health programs. And so thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Dr. Armstrong. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here talking with you uh, in such a fine institution. Um, I'm just going to dive right in because I've got a full uh, time and hopefully we'll have some time left for questions. Uh, let's see, my uh, uh, relationships with industry are as follows. I have one significant uh, issue, which is I have stock in a company called Dynamic Air Health, but we are not discussing anything in regards to that treatment modality today. I do have what I would call uh, biases that come from my involvement uh, with the American Society of Addiction Medicine, a, a non-funded physician as their past president and the Federation president of the Federation of State Physician Health Programs. And that's going to leak through in this uh, talk today, obviously, because of my uh, involvement in both those organizations. So <clears throat> let's start off talking about mental health issues among physicians. And uh, there's a list of them here you see in front of you, including problems with work-life balance, which really all of us will have during our career, um, and as like many other professionals. We also suffer from issues of stress and burnout and compassion fatigue. Uh, those are obviously worsening during times when the mental health and when of uh, our all of our healthcare providers are stressed by such things as the pandemic. Physicians, as we'll talk about in a minute, are more susceptible to depressive illnesses. Um, we also do see post-traumatic stress disorder issues, uh, especially among uh, people that have been traumatized by childhood experiences. And in the physician health program world, we tend to see it a little more in physicians that have been in military service in country uh, when there's been significant trauma. Substance use disorders, we're going to talk about a lot today, and we're going to use that as a leverage to kind of understand a little bit more about physician health. And finally, <clears throat> there's some maladaptive personality characteristics that physicians uniquely have, and we're going to be talking about that as we um, dribble through this lecture today. Importantly, we need to remember that mental health issues are all interrelated. Stress, depression, burnout, and substance misuse all have a deeply interactive quality. And when people arrive in care uh, for uh, any of these conditions, there's, all, you know, we need to look at all of those different aspects of that physician's life. Uh, and as we will talk about in a minute, physicians are especially uh, prone to this, not only due to systemic issues, but also personal issues. 
So focusing specifically on substance use disorders now for a minute, physicians uh, who develop substance use disorders are often the most highly regarded providers. As a matter of fact, the uh, uh, Tom Philpot, uh, who's in your department of anesthesia uh, many years ago, said he calls addiction among uh, anesthesiologists the AOA disease for uh, reasons uh, that match with that concept of being the most highly regarded physicians. When a healthcare professional has an illness such as substance use disorder, it often has been present and often has been ignored for a long time. Thus, it can produce impairment, and there's a difference we'll talk about in a minute about the difference between having an illness and having an impairment. Um, if an illness uh, exists for a long enough period of time, that physician can have some impairment in their skills and place the public at risk. And that's really why physician health programs are in the unique position we are. Um, we also know that mental health problems among physicians intensifies work conflicts, deteriorates morale, and does risk patient safety. Uh, the term of art that we use in our field is that physicians are categorized as safety sensitive workers. And I've had the pleasure in my career of taking care of many different groups of safety sensitive workers. Um, the other group that I've spent a fairly long time talking about are professional uh, airline pilots. And no one would argue that they're not safety sensitive workers. And really no one would argue that physicians are not safety sensitive workers. If, if that means that the safety of the public uh, is at risk, uh, not necessarily a one-on-one -on -one correlation, but there's a potential for that risk once they develop any kind of uh, condition which uh, places them in the category of deterioration. So let's talk briefly about what are the demographics. I'm gonna do this from hopefully from the 10,000 foot view. The prevalence rates of addiction among physicians for lifetime prevalence um, uh, vary between 7.9% an early study by uh, Dr. Hughes from 1992 to a more recent study by Mika Raskovich um, uh, placing the point prevalence at 13.9%. So the answer is probably the lifetime prevalence conservatively is 10%. That means that one out of 10 of us will develop a, a problem with substance misuse throughout their lifetime. So this is not a rare disease. This is not an unusual condition. This is a very common condition among physicians. Physicians consume less tobacco and used to consume more opioids than the general public. The general public has caught up with physicians more recently but those two substances of misuse do have a disproportionate underrepresentation in physicians regarding tobacco and an overrepresentation regarding opioids, again, up until recently. There's a suggestion in the literature that physicians consume more alcohol than the general population, especially as we age. And alarmingly, male physicians have a uh, 1.4 times uh, uh, odds ratio of developing uh, a suicidal event. And, and alarmingly, women physicians are almost 2.3 times more likely to suicide than non-physicional cohorts. That's the work of Miriam Schoenhammer and her, her colleagues. That, uh, that figure should alarm all of us uh, sitting in this room today. What about age? Uh, this is a study we did uh, many years ago um, at a treatment center I was running. Uh, we took a look back about 11 years and noted that we had 1,400 medical students, residents, and physicians who entered treatment. So this is the age at which individuals enter treatment, not in which they develop the illness. And you see this wonderfully bell-shaped curve um, with a median of around 46 years of age of when a physician arrives in treatment. And again, important to remember, this is not when the illness begins, but the point at which they tend to arrive in treatment. So what about gender? Well, uh, males account for more physician addiction cases than women with a ratio of seven to 10 to one, depending on the multiple studies that are out there. And that contrasts with somewhat older data that I have of a three to one male to female ratio. As we all know, that ratio is approximating 50-50 uh, as we move forward, a, a really uh, fine change, I think, in the 
uh, composition of physicians in our society. That seven to one ratio of physician addiction cases, again, arriving in treatment. Uh, my wife, who's a psychologist, likes to point out that's further evidence of the inferiority of the male half of the species. Physicians, however, female physicians, however, are more likely to report problematic drinking by the end of medical school than their non-physician counterparts. So that's comparing physicians, female physicians at, at the end of medical school age to uh, women in the population at large. They're more likely to have alcohol problems later in life than their non-medical counterparts. And they're more li likely to be younger and have more medical and psychiatric comorbidity by the time they show up in treatment. And this is an older study, but one that should uh, raise all of our hackles is that females appear to be the subject of more severe sanctions by medical boards than their male counterparts. That's the work of Marty Wunsch uh, from 2007. That actually is changing with the medical boards across the United States today, I'm happy to report, but that data still uh, should give us pause. Well, what about specialty? Um, there's an analysis, there's, we did a met, somewhat of a meta-analysis many years ago um, that uh, took a look at 11 different studies from greater than 32 years. There were multiple ways of sampling the physician population from, um, from a, uh, surveys to uh, anonymous surveys to medical board data. Um, and we, that, all those studies, when combined, looked at almost 6,800 physicians. And there were overrepresentation and underrepresentation. And overrepresentation means that the, um, the probability of that person having that specialty was higher than predicted based upon the percentage of physicians who are in that specialty in general. Uh, and not surprisingly, anesthesiology comes out near the top and has done so in all of the studies. Psychiatry is also higher. Uh, emergency medicine appears to be higher uh, than the general population in terms of overrepresentation in ad having addiction disorders. Family practice is it's barely statistically significant. I would probably not consider that um, to be a, a strongly valid uh, in piece of information. And, but interestingly, there, there's at least one specialty which is underrepresented, meaning if you're a pediatrician, you have a lower uh, likelihood of having a substance use disorder than the physician population at large. Uh, and we don't know why that is. Uh, it might be the types of uh, situations, it might be the training, it might be the type of person that tends to go into that field. Uh, internists uh, in general, just uh, re re reflecting on the population I'm speaking today, internal medicine specialists are right smack dab in the middle. Uh, they happen to be somewhat overrepresented in the Georgia PHP population compared with the number of uh, physicians in the state, but that number may or may not be significant. All right, so next is what type of substances are misused by uh, physicians and not surprisingly, uh, alcohol has been and remains the number one uh, substance of misuse by physicians who show up in treatment for um, substance use disorder. And that position has been solid in, throughout my career. Um, opioids are pretty consistently the number two drug of misuse, but the type of opioid has changed. I talk a lot about this, and when I speak to the medical students, I say, uh, the drug of the high, most commonly misused opioid when I started uh, in addiction medicine was meperidine or Demerol. And partially because you never see Demerol prescribed hardly ever again. Um, and it's off many formulary, formularies, the misuse of uh, Demerol or uh, meperidine has disappeared. But interestingly enough, there's some substances that uh, opioids that uh, I want to warn against. Um, in terms of misuse liability and um, the tramadol um, is the, one of the uh, drugs that um, has a rise in misuse among physicians, even though it's perceived as being maybe more like a minor opioid. Benzodiazepines are misused by physicians, um, usually in combination with other substances of misuse. 
uh, prescription stimulants are misused. And we're, now that we're seeing more and more prescriptions uh, for stimulants for attention deficit disorder uh, and more availabilities of uh, 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 psychostimulants in the population, not surprisingly, the uh, occurrence of stimulant use disorder is rising. We also see methamphetamine misuse in Georgia. We see this in, uh, it tends to be characteristic of men who have sex with men. Uh, that, that cohort tends to have a higher probability of methamphetamine misuse. Marijuana use is also problematic. And uh, when we're look, taking a look across the United States, uh, what's gonna happen about marijuana misuse is up for grabs, basically. As it becomes legalized in more and more states, it's going to show up more often in random drug screening protocols, for instance, that, that some hospitals have. And how we handle that is really quite a conundrum at this point. Um, I will say that um, the problem with that is that it's unlike alcohol, um, it's harder to determine if an individual is a substance misuser when there's a positive screen for THC uh, because the substance stays in the urine for longer, and also because it's hard to determine the state of intoxication with marijuana uh, and, uh, in risking uh, workplace safety. And finally, a substance which is a little surprising is propofol. Propofol has, uh, propofol misuse has had a sharp increase over the years. Um, and we've reported on uh, multiple cases of this, again, usually in anesthesia providers. All right, so that's the kind of view of the uh, landscape, so to speak. Let's uh, shift a little bit and we're gonna kind of pull in the other um, uh, conditions, if you will, that I talked about at the beginning in talking about the etiology of addiction among physicians and how those factors play in terms of its treatment. Well, the first uh, and strongest predictor of addiction among the general population and physicians um, is really genetics. Uh, it, the, probably the most impressive set of um, uh, uh, reviews of, uh, of statistical data suggests that about 50% of the driver for addiction in the general populations and in the physician population is genetics. And I often tell uh, when I speak the medical school there at Emory, for instance, I say, um, if you want to understand whether someone is at risk for addiction, um, learn how to ask questions of your patients about a family history of addiction, which is hard to suss out at times, but it should be done by real, anyone that's taking a history because genetics are very powerful drivers and account really for 50% of the uh, addiction. Uh, it's about 50% of the loading, if you will, for the development of addiction. Exposure to high, highly addictive substances places one at increased risk. We see that most commonly in uh, anesthesia providers, as I was saying earlier, where there are, are other providers that misuse something like um, uh, fentanyl. Or what we see uh, in the general population today with fentanyl is it's a, the more highly addictive and the more highly, more rapidly the, it uh, uh, fuels the onset of the illness of addiction, uh, the more at risk there is when there is higher exposure to those substances. Speaking specifically about physicians, though, and this is the work of George Valent uh, uh, and really one of the most remarkable set of, uh, of long-term uh, studies of physicians um, uh, and published in multiple different journals and uh, is to talk a little bit about family of origin issues. Um, the, Dr. Valent said that physicians often come from emotionally barren families that train the child to cope by focusing externally, healing others instead of practicing self-care. And I love this quote, then medicine becomes a strain only when the physician asks him or herself to give more than he or she has been given. Those types of things place us at risk. And uh, the other issue that's aligned with, deeply aligned with that, is that physicians often come from achievement-oriented homes where he or she learns to place achievement above self-care. 
So that is another issue that tends to drive physicians and one that we see when they uh, come into treatment. Um, and then finally, a higher than normal percentage of physicians come from homes with genetic loading for chemical dependency. The other two, uh, the other piece I want to set, spend a minute talking about are what about training issues? Well, one of the things that's interesting about physicians is that all of this schooling that encourages an over-reliance on cognitive intelligence to the detriment of emotional intelligence places people at risk. So the, the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems with addiction is it's an illness that is, is nearly impossible to think one's way out of, despite the fact that it um, might be considered just a, a mental health or a choice kind of laden uh, illness. In addition, extended schooling often delays emotional maturity. Um, I, when I speak to the medical students, students, I say, you know, you're, you're in this cocoon that's very different from the external world, uh, and, uh, and, and you're delayed in terms of getting out in the real world, often until you're in your mid-30s. And then the last piece that I talk about, and it's applicable to all of us today, is that training encourages the development of a false external persona. And all of us have had this experience. The first time you go in with your little short white coat and you have a proctor that shoves you into the room with the patient. Uh, and it, that patient says, well, doctor, let me tell you about my problems. And all of a sudden you're that medical student that says, oh my goodness, what, what am I supposed to do here? That very moment creates this uh, external uh, persona uh, that depicts confidence and self-reliance and says, well, tell me about your problems. Uh, and, and in doing so, that false persona can begin to become part of the uh, patient's, uh, of the physician's uh, reality and moving forward, and oftentimes is hard to discard. It's especially, by the way, hard um, for individuals that, uh, that w practice in rural areas where they're where they are the local doc, if you will, or the local surgeon or the local OBGYN, it's very hard for the public often to see that individual uh, as anything but a physician and they themselves have difficulties with that as well. Other training issues create stressors for us. Um, we really have little time often to work through the he heavy burden of death and trauma. And we're often uh, taught to detach and ignore the emotional burden of managing our, the illnesses we care from, care for. And that sidesteps some of this is normal processing and psychological healing over time, that emotional trauma erodes emotional and physical health, meaning that all of us as physicians need to spend more time dealing with self-care so that this toll will not slowly erode um, our uh, ability to um, feel comfort in the world around us. And lastly, I, this is my favorite slide, so you, you have to sit with me while I go through it. This is one of my favorite slides that work from Glenn Gabbard. Uh, Dr. Gabbard is one of the really leading P, uh, individuals that understands the physician personality. He's written extensively on that. Um, so this is uh, from a, a JAMA article and a, and a subsequent follow-up article by Ed Nace et al. In, uh, in his book. And this is about a personality trait that most physicians share, which is the, more of the compulsive personality. And I'm not talking about a severe you know, uh, 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 personality disorder that's deeply disruptive, but all of us even if we arrive in medical school without compulsive personality traits, learn to develop them to survive. And there are three aspects that we're going to talk about in the middle there. Uh, though the first aspect is doubt, and doubt creates intellectual rigor. Uh, intellectual rigor um, is a good thing created by doubt. You may actually be sitting in this lecture with me, and from time to time, the thought may go through your head like, what's his data for that? You know, is, is he, are we sure that's right? That's all of your intellectual rigor coming up, uh, uh, popping up from time to time in, in, uh, throughout this, this and other lectures and you're training people. So that creates a healthy uh, process. The second aspect is guilt of a compulsive personality and that produces conscientiousness. 
uh, even though your days are busy, you all show up on time for this lecture and you, you know, are, are, uh, that conscientiousness uh, drives you to be prompt in your uh, showing up and completing your work. And then the last aspect is an exaggerated sense of exaggerated responsibility, and that produces reliability. You show up, you do the right thing. Um, and uh, those three characteristics in the healthy individual means that the compulsive personality has intellectual rigor, conscientiousness, conscientiousness and reliability. But what happens when that personality structure is stressed? We go to the right hand side and the doubt creates self-esteem problems. The guilt produces helplessness and the exaggerated responsibility creates omnipotence. So interestingly enough, this is what we often see with the physicians that are showing up in treatment with their lives kind of crumbling around them, sometimes because of their substance use disorders, difficulties at home, they tend to be uh, what we often kind of somewhat chidingly call egomaniacs with low self-esteem. And that really is what happens to this uh, compulsive personality trait when it is stressed beyond its ability to cope. And I need to say that most people with physicians who are physicians have at least some aspects of this personality trait. That means that Dr. Gabbard labeled the normal physician as a moder moderately well compensated obsessive compulsive neurotic with a dominant superego that's conscientiousness driven and depression prone. Well, that's not such a good uh, process there, is it? That's not such a good uh, uh, indictment of us. And what we need to do is keep working on self-care. Well, there are also some external things which um, drive this problem of being a physician. Um, and the biggest one, the biggest external one we think today is uh, electronic health records. And when I talk about electronic health records, I, uh, people that know me know me as a, a, a kind of a, a, I'm a computer nut. Um, and uh, I, I'm not saying, I'm not a Luddite. I'm not saying EHRs are wrong. I'm saying that they are nascent. They're in their early stages. And all of us are struggling with the amount of work that they require of us, which is frankly stupid, irrelevant to the daily care of our patients. Um, and any of us, uh, I just recently actually was in Emory University Hospital not long ago, and I got my discharge information, all 35 pages of it, which uh, most of which, which was redundant, and two or three pages which had relevant data for me because I requested my record. So you get the point that not only is the input somewhat redundant, the output is as well. That produces stress. And we can look at burnout. This is Tate Shannonfell et al.'s paper, famous paper today, which is really an interesting when you take a look at the uh, characteristics of burnout. And burnout is really an important, it's not a, it's unfortunately fallen into our parlance, if you will. Oh, I'm really burned out on this. But actually burnout is a very characteristic syndrome with uh, very sp specific criteria. And if you take a look at this, different, different specialties have a different level of burnout, all the way from above 50% for emergency medicine down to 33% for pathology, psychiatry, and mental health. So burnout is also part of our situation today, and might I be as bold to say that the corporatization of medicine has not, not helped with that at all either. So we've got burnout, we've got stress, we've got a compulsive personality, no wonder we're at risk. Importantly, burnout is associated with all of these uh, abilities, all of these characteristics here, which are the very traits that define a good physician places her or him at a greater risk for burnout. So th this is important and it's important to figure out how to create balance in our lives. And if we don't, then we're at risk for lots of conditions, including substance use disorder. There are also a couple of characteristics which, um, uh, which uh, can um, look at, uh, which can decrease the odds ratio of burnout, including greater than 50% of time in non-patient care and uh, age. As we age, the percentage of people that are burnout seems to decrease. All right, so we've talked about the 
uh, mental health conditions in general. We've talked a little bit about the causation for substance use. The rest of this lecture is going to talk about probably the greatest success rate uh, for any mental health condition, and that's the addiction treatment for physicians. Um, I'm proud to say that in this field, we've done a really good job of learning how to take care of ourselves. So, but what is, makes physician treatment different? Well, there are several characteristics of addiction treatment which makes it physician. The most different, the most important thing to know is that physicians really do poorly in generalized addiction treatment centers, but they do really well in specialized treatment programs. And this is for several different reasons. One is that those programs know how to deal with these, all of this physician personality we talked about. But importantly, it's also because physicians who are the only physician in a setting where everyone where everyone else is a non-physician have di difficulties discarding that physician mantle to be a person in treatment versus a physician in treatment. So it's uh, all of these centers have peers that are many of their peers uh, are physicians uh, or other healthcare providers, often uh, PAs, nurse anesthetists, pharmacists, and that sort of thing. So many times it, there's an admixture, but there's often the, when we see the best success rates in the physician health program world, um, we notice that those come uh, for treatment centers where a, a, a large majority of the patients there um, are indeed uh, physicians as well. Physicians, um, despite their education, often really have thick denial of their illness and inability to see that illness along with some debilitating shame. It's, it's it, you know, um, as Sir, Sir William Osler said, the physician who treats himself as a fool for a patient. Um, but it's hard for physicians to, be, to de develop that mantle of, uh, of being a patient. And they often have difficulty seeing their illness because they're busy uh, seeing others versus themselves. In addition, healthcare professionals, if they tend to misuse drugs, often obtain those drugs in work-related situations. That creates an intensifying secrecy and shame, and that work-related triggers have to be discussed and drug refusal skills practiced while in a safe treatment setting. So that mandates a specific support group and specific training for healthcare professionals that matches their conditions at their work setting and their home. We have these common uh, comorbid conditions. I'm not gonna run through them all, but uh, we plenty oftentimes when people are in treatment, they have a unipolar depression, more, more uncommon, a bipolar illness. There's often family and partner, con or family or partner conflict. Uh, a lot of our folks have adverse childhood or adult experiences that create some PTSD. There's also some sexual issues and all of us, including yours truly have problems with work-life balance. The other reason that physician care, besides the specialty of the initial treatment, and probably the biggest single reason, is uh, what you'll hear me say throughout this lecture, is that what we're doing in the care of physicians with substance use disorders, we're treating substance use disorder as a chronic condition, which it truly is. Now, chronic does not mean that the substance is misused for a long time. But the shifting of the brain thinking patterns that occur when substance abuse occurs uh, are long lasting and really best thought of as lifelong. What happens during for care is most physicians are an initial dose of treatment, uh, which is somewhere between 60 and 90 days. And then after they finish that care, they are involved in a monitoring system that uses a tool to determine the status of their illness. And that tool is substance use, uh, substance uh, screening. The thing that's really cool about what I do in, in the treatment of addiction is I have a people, my, my, the folks that I work with have a, a mental health condition where I've got a definitive screen that looks at the status of that illness. And at least if the screens are negative, you can say that the end stage of the illness has not occurred. There might be some prodrome concerns, but substance uh, screening is really a wonderful tool. And we look at it as if we look at drug screening uh, to the individual with a substance use disorder 
as one would look at the blood sugar in a diabetic. It's, it's just an, something that assesses the status of the illness. In addition, almost all of our professionals attend some type of mutual health meeting. Uh, the most commonly attended mutual health meetings are Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous, but many of our people uh, go to uh, celebrate recovery if they have a Christian uh, faith that uh, feels that AA for some reason doesn't work for them, or uh, refuge recovery uh, is one for um, those that have a more Buddhist or uh, type of uh, slant. Um, and there are also uh, some more uh, cognitive behavioral things such as celebrate recovery, but those some type of mutual help meetings we, uh, are important for a prolonged period. Uh, all of our individuals uh, in our program for the entire five years meet once a week in something we call Caduceus. That moniker Caduceus is just a group of folks that talk about what it's like to be a physician in recovery. Uh, our people at Emory talk about what it's like to be an Emory physician in recovery and how, how they can uh, do best their best work and, and what do they deal, things like what do you do when a patient comes in and talks about their substance use disorder? How do you handle that? For the first two years, our physicians that are with us, our physicians attend a group therapy with physicians uh, like them, and those group therapies allow uh, uh, time to resolve issues such as the partner conflict, such as family conflict, such as work conflict that occurred, and the other lingering difficulties of creating work-life balance. Some of our folks have some family therapy or individual therapy, which is interdigitated if necessary at times throughout the, that period of time. What we do is chronic disease management, and the data that we have is over the prolonged period. And unlike substance use disorder in the general population, our outcome data shows that somewhere between 86 and 90% of our individuals are in remission at five years. Totally different data, very positive data compared to um, the uh, issues with substance use disorder in the general population. So physician health programs really provide chronic disease management. Now it's interesting, uh, well, let's, so let's talk about the, how that system works uh, some more. Um, before there was a physician health program in Georgia, and Georgia is one of the last states in the United States to have a physician's health program. When we were able to get the legislation passed, um, a group of us um, left the treatment world and decided we were going to make sure that the physician health program in Georgia worked. But before there was a physician health program, if you had a substance use disorder or sometimes you had a mental health condition, you often had to work directly with the licensing board. Now, you as the physician who might be ill is concerned about protecting your license, confidential, confidentiality, and effective treatment, but the licensing board is really interested in public safety and has a limited vesting in confident, your confidentiality. Then, if you wind up going to some kind of treatment, yeah, the treatment program is interested in your confidentiality and effective treatment, but not public safety and the hospital system or your, uh, that you're working with, they're concerned about hospital liability and patient safety and staff wellness, but everyone has a different agenda here. And the worst part about that is with, in the past, before we had a physician health program, everyone's talking to everybody. And you can imagine the lack of confidentiality that occurred with all of that. So how things changed uh, when the physician health program uh, be became part of our state is the physician health program in interdigitated itself in between the licensing board and the ill physician. Now we are wall-eyed. We have one eye on effective treatment and confidentiality when we have another and another part of us has to have a, a, a and my other other eye on public safety. The licensing board has been very positive about us and um, Almost uh, currently today, 96% of our participants are totally unknown to the medical board. And when our physicians develop a substance use disorder and go to treatment, then when they have to renew their license two years later, they do not have to report that to the licensing board, which in the past they would have had to do have done. That means that they can get the treatment that they need with confidentiality 
And that means that the licensing board can feel safe that the health of Georgia's physicians is maintained. So that's what we do. And we make sure that the licensing board knows about our behaviors, what we're dealing with, but we do not disclose the vast, actually the only cases that ever get known today by the licensing board uh, are rare cases that show up at the licensing board before they show up to us. And in addition, we work with hospital staffs. We work with Emory. We work with, um, you know, the Piedmont system. All of them know about us and we advocate for the individual physician who becomes ill to return to work and to practice with safety so that the hospital understands that patient safety is maintained as well. We also work with the treatment programs around the state. We really are almost like a quality control system to some degree. We make sure all the important issues get addressed. So that's our role as a physician's health program. As you can well imagine, there is an uneasy balance between this issue of uh, wellness, illness, and impairment. And there are people who develop addiction disorders that go on to being impaired and actually practicing while impaired, although those numbers are dropping. And on the other hand, we're very interested in wellness issues as well and making sure that we're proactive, prevention driven. And so that's me in the middle walking that tightrope between those two issues. Today, I'm happy to say that more often than not, cases come to us when there is illness present, but no impairment and the public has not been placed at risk. Um, if there is a concern about um, patient safety, we, we make sure that that individual is removed from their practice while they get the care that they need. But that's the very much an exception rather than the rule today. So the other thing that's important is that what we are as a physician health program is we're independent from the medical boards and the treatment providers. We have no, uh, uh, what we do is report to the medical board. We report uh, uh, aggregate data to the medical board. We rarely talk about specific cases. Uh, with treatment providers, uh, we have a group of treatment providers that we know and work with across the United States that have an expertise in dealing with physicians, but we have no agenda with them besides ensuring that they give good care. Um, we, what we practice is something that's called a safe harbor, where the physician can enter anonymous care for mental health uh, substance use disorder, and, and I'll say it again, over 95% of our participants remain anonymous to the medical board. I'm going to skip the slide so I can finish. Um, occasionally, when if physicians are with us over that five year, they have a lapse in their uh, in their uh, or disease recurrence. Um, and what we often do is go in early. Uh, we um, have very minimal intrusion into that individual's life because oftentimes a um, a, a lapse of remission from their illness is. Uh, simply because uh, specific issues weren't addressed. We increase the type of therapy that's provided by external providers. Uh, we do all kinds of different uh, training uh, in relapse prevention. Uh, and on occasion, those individuals might go to some higher level of care. And on occasion, those individuals may need to stop practicing for brief periods of time. So even if a relapse occurs um, uh, or, or uh, from someone who is in our program, uh, there's often a very brief interruption of their ability to practice. And the last piece is work reentry. We talk with each, we deal with, by the way, with Emory, we deal with each of your departments when someone comes in. We make sure that they uh, have uh, a safe operating environment. We make sure that the practice, uh, someone at, within the practice, system knows about that individual's remission rate and, and, and uh, our status, and we ask for an, a very quiet quarterly uh, response that says that individual is doing well back at work. And all of the, we work with every department at Emory uh, and every uh, the other hospital systems around, and, and they, um, in general, uh, are appreciative of our involvement. Sometimes they get a little tired because occasionally a form has to be filled out. 
Occasionally a hospital credentialing comes in place and licensure issues and specialty boards. We get involved with those and advocate um, to ensure that that physician is able to continue to practice medicine. And in today's environment, um, probably we, it's when we have a case that has a, 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 a blip with licensure or a specialty board concern, because sometimes specialty boards ask about this, um, and ninety nine percent of the time those are um, uh, are dealt with and we're advocates for the individual who's in remission once they've reentered uh, the workplace. Um, so here are a couple of research papers. This is an older research page, uh, paper from the British Medical Journal. Uh, this showed uh, that um, th this was from uh, you know almost um, uh, uh, sixteen years ago. So the data is almost 20 years old today, and we've actually gotten better. But at that time, 80% of people completed treatment and resumed practice. And, um, and there were occasional relapses, as you see, uh, in 19% over five years. Now that number is down to about 7% over five years. Um, and uh, at the end of the five-year period, almost 80% of physicians were licensed and work working. Some of them had their licenses revoked. Again, that was because the medical boards at the time were more punitive and some a certain percentage uh, had retired and, and some had died. So that's all there is. This is my email in case you ever ask, have, need to ask me for uh, about questions about things. The georgiaphp.org for some reason that says georgiaphp.org.net. That's a typo. Sorry about that. It's gaphp.org is our website. And that's my website, and you see my email uh, there to if you ever have, have questions. And that's all I had. So, so that was fantastic. Um, I will tell you that I've received a lot of um, text and feedback already about uh, from many people, you know, essentially saying how both how fascinating this is and how much they feel seen in aspects of their position life, um, and. Um, uh, and I think, you know, describing the position and the pressures and so on are things we all resonate with. We've got some questions in the chat already. Um, I want to start with Dr. Farley's question. What do you believe is the best approach by a hospital system or university in dealing with a physician who's in the PHP and experiences a relapse? Oh, that's a great question. So the, the first thing to do is to, to approach it with the same way you would approach someone if let's say they uh, were a little confused one day at work because um, of a hypoglycemic attack of their uh, hypoglycemia from their diabetes the most important thing to do is attitude we're concerned about you this doesn't seem to be you uh, and um, the attitude is really critical uh, because people with substance use disorders, uh, as one of my uh, mentors used to say, suffer from a surfeit of shame. <laughs> so going at, into the situation and saying, um, we're concerned about you. Um, can we, uh, we would like to talk to the PHP um, and um, we want you to be as healthy as possible. And I, some things, we've had some concerns about that. Um, the, the, that's really uh, the most productive way of, of dealing with it. Um, when you call the PHP, um, uh, yeah, your own, the, when you call the PHP, um, oftentimes we have one individual that we have a release to speak to. We have to have a release to do that. And, um, uh, and then what we would do most commonly is if it's possible to get that, make sure that that physician, if there's concerns about safety to practice, to get them out of the clinic, out of the operating room, get them to a safe place. Uh, and we can move, the PHP can work forward with getting them connected with, uh, with a provider who is, um, uh, who, who can help analyze the situation. So that's really the, the, the you know, a, a lot of the, uh, uh, medical directors of different uh, hospitals, for instance, have my number on speed dial and they call and say, I'm concerned about Dr. Jones, Dr. Smith. 
and, and we say, okay, let's move forward. And to approach it as if we're just worried about you. You're not yourself today. Um, uh, try to avoid the accusatory things or you're using substances, but say we're worried about you. You just don't seem to be yourself and we'd like you to kind of, you know, uh, get to a safe place and we're going to uh, have someone take over your patients for the rest of the day. Uh, Dr. Del Rio, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you very much, Wendy. And, and thank you, Paul. This is terrific. And I think everybody should listen to this because it's such a critical issue. My question has to deal with when the physician or that that has not yet recognized the problem and has not been recognized has continued to practice uh, while impaired. And then, you know, what is our responsibility in notifying patients and, you know, to telling somebody, hey, we just discovered that Dr. Such and Such likely operated on you while he was in, he or she was impaired. Uh, what's the, what's the, the recommendations that you have? Because obviously that has implications for that individual as far as disclosure. Yes. I mean, I think the thing, um, I, I think I wouldn't, I think that probably implying that a physician is the causation of problems that from the get go, uh, Dr. Del Rio is, um, is a, a risky one. Um, I would say rather, um, can you come in? There's a concern about, we want to make sure that your surgery went okay. Um, that's probably the best way to proceed with the patient group. Um, you don't want to do anything that's going to invite uh, a, a, a litigation, for instance, but you do want to make sure that that patient's health is concerned and health is worried about. So uh, what often happens um, in those cases, uh, actually, I want to say, first of all, um, the numbers of cases over 40 years, the number of cases where I can definitely say a physician's behavior due to substance use caused a negative, a significant negative outcome are, are very small. It's, it, it's, it's something we all are scared to death about, but it is really surprisingly rare. Um, on the other hand, being um, careful is the right way to go. Um, we, we want you to come in, we want to check your wound, we want to make sure everything's going okay, uh, makes an appropriate sense. And if, if there's concerns, maybe that the individuals, um, that there was something that occurred in the operating theater, for instance, that caused the problem, maybe being careful about how you do the billing of that thing would be appropriate. But uh, it's really quite rare that that occurs. Um, and um, if, and uh, so, so I, I, I think, not getting too wrapped around an axle about it is the right way to do it and to say, let's let's look at these cases. Um, there was a case many years ago where a physician was um, making somewhat cavalier decisions about what antibiotic to use post-op uh, because they just weren't thinking clearly. Um, and in that that occurred in a in a, actually occurred in I could say this with safety because it occurred in another state, and um, what happened is the hospital just called all those individuals saying we want to make sure you're okay, um, and and let's take a look at you. That brought them in. They did some extra testing, and and nothing happened. The 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 despite the um, popularity of Doctor Death. That uh, podcast and that uh, and that I guess it was a I'm just, I don't know what network that was on. That guy was a sociopath. He happened to have a a a, uh, uh, a substance use disorder, but that is not the kinds of cases we see. We see really the vast majority of the docs that we see in our program are really good docs, and they they get sick. Yeah, um, and, it's, an it's an illness. Thank you very much. Yes. I want to try and get at least two more questions in. Um, so um, sort of just um, quickly, so a little bit rapid fire, um, lumping a couple. Um, how for phys physicians who are suffering from moral injury, burnout, and may have risky use of substances, what do you recommend as a first step? How early should they call PHP? And do physicians have to go themselves or can a friend send an anonymous concern and you reach out to them? So all about sort of notification. Great, I'll try to do that rapid fire. Um, the, if, if you, if you, I'll answer the second person first. If you anonymously have a concern about an individual 
and you don't give us a route into dealing with that individual that becomes, you know, cause we are, um, we have to, we really have to have a way of connecting with that person. We can't call them up and say, Hey, Dr. X, um, someone called about you cause that just doesn't go anywhere. So some type of intervention, and it really works well in hierarchical systems to have someone that they report to say, I'm concerned about you. I'd have, I'd like to have you talk with the PHP. We do get a lot of referrals that come in and they may be worried about a substance use disorder, but they're more concerned about stress, burnout and compassion fatigue. And we can get those people connected to psychotherapists in the city that do a fine job with that, that are able to help those individuals work through the issues of their uh, of the workplace conflict uh, that uh, is contributing, you know, maybe the long hours or maybe a conflict in the workplace, or maybe they themselves are suffering from a depressive illness. A lot of our referrals actually are for depression, but I, today I talked about substance use disorders. So there, you, we have to get a referral, which we can take action on. So the right thing to do is to say, okay, um, I'm concerned about my friend. Is there some way we can get that person some help in a compassionate way, but with enough pressure that they actually will talk to the PHP and we can begin to evaluate them. What we do is we don't, we do an initial screening, but we send people out to one of our, uh, uh, the psychiatrists in town who have an expertise in understanding the physician personality. And they often do an evaluation They come back and say, well, there's no, there's some depression here, which really needs to do. There's some conflict in the home. There's no substance use disorder. We kind of sit down with that person and say, we'd like to connect you with some family therapy, some individual therapy, and maybe adjust your work schedule for a period of time. So that can be effective. Now there was this first part to the question that I don't think I answered. <laughs> well, I have one more I want to get to. The first part was really how early is too early. How, how early is too early. Um, if, if, if you call us and say, um, I'm concerned about my friend, John, and I'm going to get him on the phone. The two of us are going to talk with you. Um, oftentimes we can find out some things and say, you know, let's get some, let's get you some therapy. Let's figure out how to do this. So it can be as early as, um, there's a bad patient outcome and you see the person having a ruminative response or a little bit of an acute depression response. We deal with those things all the time and we find, um, uh, you know, a lower, a lower intensity of care for the, such individuals. So I wouldn't worry about it being too early. Um, uh, and uh, sometimes when it's really early, it, you feel like you don't have the right to call, but I, I think the right thing to do with us would be to, to uh, call our number. Let's see, did I put the phone number on that? Uh -huh. I, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure. Well, I, you send back to me, I can send around sort of contact info. I can send that. There's, it's, it's, uh, we've got an 800 number. And, and by the way, it's gaphp.org is the website and the phone numbers, 800 numbers on that. Perfect. Last quick question, quick. Um, you know, I think many people are interested in the tension between PHPs and then institutional legal counsel and HR policies. Um, I, this person said, I'm aware of several colleagues returning to work after treatment that run up against very restrictive and not very patient-centered requirements. What's your recommendation for the balance between ensuring patient safety and adherence to long-term maintenance um, versus being physician-patient-centered? Well, for, first of all, um, um, we have sufficient constraints around safety that occur within the PHP system. So a legal department creating um, uh, contractual uh, dings or, or consequences is hostile and inappropriate uh, because you wouldn't do that if someone had uh, said, had a couple of, uh, they, they went into DKA once or twice at work. You wouldn't say, well, we're, you know, if that happens again, we're going to fire you and prevent you from getting a job elsewhere. I mean, it, the problem is, is, is you have to figure out with your legal counsel and the institutions to look at this, to look at the mental health consequences and respond in a mental health way. And that legal interdictions basically only come across as shaming and are counterproductive. 
Thank you so much. Um, and we'll close on that. I think um, uh, judging from the people who have remained on until after the hour, this has been actually a really um, insightful and fantastic uh, talk that I think um, helps all of us. We're really, really grateful for your time. Great. I'm going to put in the chat the uh, gaphp.org. I, has... I did already, even. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. Appreciate your time. Thank you.